Icons take center stage in Final Fantasy XVI, ultra-powerful magical creatures who play a central role in shaping the political landscape amidst a time of conflict in Valisthea. But the likes of Ice Queen Shiva and Fire Demon Ifrit have long had a place in the mechanics and storytelling across Final Fantasy titles. In celebration of the recent launch of the latest installment in Square Enix's flagship RPG series, we're breaking down the history of summons in Final Fantasy. Eidolons, Espers, Guardian Forces, Eons, Primals, call them what you will, summonable creatures have been a cornerstone of the Final Fantasy franchise for over 30 years. Making their first appearance in Final Fantasy III in 1990, the initial roster included eight summons, including series regulars Ifrit, Shiva, Ramu, Titan, Odin, and Bahamut, all of whom are present as icons in Final Fantasy XVI. These creatures were summonable by the Evoker, Sage, and Summoner jobs and had one of three effects when called upon, depending on which job had summoned them. While lower-level summons were available in shops, Final Fantasy III also introduced the long-running tradition of defeating more powerful summons in battle in order to gain the ability to summon them. In Final Fantasy IV, summons took on a more prominent role in the story. Originally called Summoned Monsters, or Phantom Beasts, the 2007 Nintendo DS release adopted the term Eidolons, which was previously used in 2000's late-gen PlayStation 1 title, Final Fantasy IX. Summonable by summoners of the Village Mist, of which party member Rydia is the sole survivor, they dwell in the alternate realm of Fey March, accessible by a cave deep underground. While Final Fantasy IV restricted summoning to a single character, Final Fantasy V's job system opened it up to any party member via the summoner job. Upon leveling up summoner, a character could equip the summon ability as another class and summon monsters up to the level they had gained in summoner. Summonable monsters were obtainable through purchase, enemy drop, or treasures found in specific maps. Though Final Fantasy V's summons were very much a game mechanic with little to no bearing on the story at large, Final Fantasy VI swung hard in the opposite direction. Called Espers, Final Fantasy VI marked the first time summons got an official name and backstory. Espers were the result of humans and animals coming into contact with magic during Three Gods' War for Dominance. Espers served as the basis for the game's magic system, which was built around Magicite, the crystallized remains of dead Espers not creepy at all, that allowed them to be summoned in battle and also granted the use of spells and status upgrades when equipped. Final Fantasy VII kept the summon monsters as magical equipment approach via its materia system, the basis for utilizing any and all spells in the game, but never really explained how these summoned creatures came to be. Except in some dummied lines that existed within the Japanese release of the game, wherein villain Sephiroth, amongst other ramblings, goes on a tangent about how they were creatures that walked the earth during the time of the ancients and had their life energy sealed away in materia. Meanwhile, while Final Fantasy VII Remake threw all that away and made most of them the creations of Kingdom Hearts reject young lad Shinra researcher Chadley. By Final Fantasy VIII, summons found themselves playing a central role in the game's mechanics and story once again. Called Guardian Forces, they junctioned to a human host's consciousness. A junction party member could draw magic from enemies in the environment, then cast it in battle or junction it to status attributes to increase speed, strength, or add elemental defense or attack properties. Final Fantasy IX limited summoning to two characters, Garnet slash Dagger and Ico, and introduced the term Eidolon, which, as previously mentioned, would be used in the DS release of Final Fantasy IV as well as Final Fantasy XII. Eidolons were summoned via gemstone and are, according to Final Fantasy IX lore, manifestations of the planet's collected memories gathered by its crystal. Of course they are. Final Fantasy X again restricted summoning to a single character, the summoner Yuna, but also completely changed the way summons worked. For the first time in the series, rather than being an in-battle cutscene resulting in massive amounts of elemental damage, summons acted as temporary party members, controlled by the player for a limited amount of time once summoned. In Final Fantasy XI, Final Fantasy's first foray into the massively multiplayer online space, avatars, as they were called, worked similarly and remained on the battlefield under the control of a summoner player character until all their MP was depleted. To different ends depending on what blood pact the summoner used to call them. A weird outlier in the series is Final Fantasy XII, where in their version of Espers, a term originating in Final Fantasy VI, all correspond to a sign of the Zodiac. None of the standard summons appear per se, more on that later, in this installment of the franchise, though many of them correspond with the Lukavi of Final Fantasy Tactics, which, like Final Fantasy XII, is set in Evil East. Eidolons make their return in Final Fantasy XIII, only this time they're Transformers! No, really, they're all mechanical and transformative vehicles. They must be defeated in battle to gain access to their power via a crystal shard called an Idolith. Final Fantasy XIV featured two names for summoned creatures, primals and icons. Well, well, look at that, Yoshi producer of Final Fantasy XIV and also XVI. 
Primals are godlike beings, with each holding dominion over a tribe within Eorzea and manifest with enough prayer and ether. Their destructive forces deeply tied to the lore and story and make for some major boss fights, too. Those who play summoner must summon fragments of a primal's power, known as Eggies, to do battle with, incomplete enough for them to maintain control of them. This is also the first game wherein Final Fantasy began to explore the idea of humanoid avatars physically assuming the form of summons, with the primal phoenix having been created from the Ellis and Sage Luis Wallevaire during a confrontation with the primal Bahamut, which kicked off A Realm Reborn. Final Fantasy XV summons were divided into two categories, astrals, colossal beings that protect Eos and are worshipped as gods, and messengers, magical beings sent to make sure humankind are aware of the astrals' will. Astrals are unlocked as part of the story, with Noctis gaining their favor and ability to summon them upon completing their trials. Exploring the individual histories and origins of every summon to ever appear in the Final Fantasy series would make for a really, 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 really long video, so in honor of the recently released Final Fantasy XVI, we'll keep our focus on those legendary creatures out here making big trouble in Little Valisthea. Central to the inciting incident that sets protagonist Clive's journey into motion is Phoenix, icon of fire whose dominant is his younger brother, Joshua Rossfield. Finding its origins in Greek mythology, the Phoenix was depicted as an immortal bird which obtained new life by rising from the ashes of its predecessor, quite literally as it was sometimes depicted as dying in a burst of flames. Phoenix made its first appearance as a summon in Final Fantasy V, where, true to its mythological origins, when summoned, it deals fire damage to all enemies while simultaneously reviving any KO'd parties to full HP slash MP. Phoenix's signature attack, Flames of Rebirth, made its debut alongside its Esper incarnation in Final Fantasy VI. In the style of its initial appearance, it both dealt fire elemental damage to all enemies while reviving any KO'd party members, but only to one quarter of their total HP. Final Fantasy VII restored Phoenix to its former glory, with Flames of Rebirth restoring fallen party members once again to full HP slash MP, and adding the option of pairing it with final attack materia, really making good on that whole Phoenix Rising from the ashes thing. Phoenix appeared in Final Fantasy VIII, summonable by using a Phoenix pinion in battle, which grants the chance for Phoenix to appear when all party members have been KO'd, dealing fire damage to enemies, and restoring the party to 12.5% of their max HP, thus preventing a game over. And though Phoenix returned as a proper summon for Ico in Final Fantasy IX, it was not summonable again until Final Fantasy XIV, where, in the Shadowbringers expansion, fragments of the legendary bird can be summoned by any summoner as part of their attack rotation upon reaching level 80 dark secondary icon of fire who sets the events of Final Fantasy XVI into motion, Ifrit finds his origins in the Islamic faith, wherein Ifrit are powerful chthonic demons formed out of smoke and fire. Interestingly, according to Islamic lore, Ifrit can be compelled by a sorcerer if summoned and has an association with jinn, invisible creatures who inhabit the realms beyond human visibility and, in the SNES version of Final Fantasy IV, released as Final Fantasy II internationally, Ifrit was called just that. Ifrit is referred to as a powerful jinn with control over scorching flames hot enough to turn the whole world to ashes in the Dissidia Final Fantasy Summon Compendium. Of note is the fact that jinn are neither inherently good nor evil, but accountable for their own actions. So mull over that while you consider Ifrit's role in Final Fantasy XVI. Ifrit made his first summonable appearance in Final Fantasy III and has been going strong ever since, including the coveted Name of an Airship appearance, which is the best star usual cast of summons could hope for in Final Fantasy XII. Throughout his life cycle as a summon, Ifrit's fiery beast-like qualities have taken center stage in his design, replacing his more straight-up demonic appearance of Final Fantasies of old. His signature ability is Hellfire, which deals well, fire damage to all opponents. Ifrit is typically one of the first summons the player receives in-game, and thus fittingly makes his appearance in the prologue of Final Fantasy XVI, albeit to a not-so-happy end. Jill Warwick, once princess of an obliterated northern territory turned ward of the Rossfields, is the dominant of a figure familiar to anyone who's played basically any Final Fantasy ever, Shiva, Icon of Ice. In mythology, Shiva is the Hindu god of destruction, notable for the blue skin around his neck, a byproduct of him having once swallowed poison to save the world. A male god who can merge with his consort Parvati to become the androgynous Ardhanarishvara, god of duality, the ice association likely comes from the fact that, whilst in his avatar form, Shiva spends most of his time in the snowy mountains of the Himalayas. The Final Fantasy version of the character also bears similarity to the Yuki Ona, literally snow woman in Japanese folklore, a spirit who appears as a beautiful, pale, blue blue-lipped woman. While there are many regional variations on the yokai, she is often depicted as beautiful and serene, but ruthless in doling out death with her icy powers. 
an OG summon dating all the way back to Final Fantasy III, she is summonable in every mainline Final Fantasy title and most of the spinoffs, except for Final Fantasy XII, where homage is paid to her in the form of an airship. Her signature attack, Diamond Dust, deals ice damage to all opponents. Permanent economic advisor to the Dalmechian Republic, Hugo Kupka, rose to prominence from his roots as a lowly foot soldier when he awakened as the dominant of Titan, icon of Earth. Like Phoenix, Titan also finds his origins in Greek mythology, wherein Titans were the primordial gods, children of Uranus, Sky, and Gaia, Earth, who were overthrown by the children of Cronus and Rhea, led by Zeus, to become the major deities, the Olympians. While there was no Titan simply called Titan, the Titan of the Final Fantasy series draws upon his Greek origins in his signature attack, Gaia's Wrath, a direct reference to the mother of Titans. Titan is summonable in every mainline Final Fantasy title wherein summons are present, except the outlier of Final Fantasy 12 with all the Zodiac summons, and weirdly, Final Fantasy 8. Titan's appearance varies wildly throughout the series, from Primordial Giant in a Loincloth and his first few appearances, to Diglett on steroids in Final Fantasy 9, to Chonky Armored Lava Rock in Final Fantasy 14, to the Gargantuan, and we do mean, like, at least eight times the size of any other icon earthly construct in Final Fantasy 16. You know, he's come a long way from his humble pixelated big boy caveman origins. Sidolphus Telamon is not only a kind, accepting father figure slash leader to formerly enslaved outcasts, but he's also the dominant of Ramu, icon of lightning. While the name could theoretically be pronounced Rama, tying him to an avatar of the Hindu god Vishnu, which seems plausible given Shiva's connection to Hindu mythology, his notable characteristics, bearded wizard with lightning powers, don't really line up. Our biggest clue actually comes from the SNES release of Final Fantasy II, which was actually Final Fantasy IV in Japan, wherein his name was translated as Indra. While it doesn't do much to explain his appearance, Indra, as depicted in Hindu mythology, was king of the devas, godlike deities, and the celestial realm of Svarga. More importantly, he was the god of weather, including lightning, thunder, and storms, all of which are characteristic of the Ramu we know from the Final Fantasy series. Similar to Titan, Ramu has appeared as a summon in most of the mainline Final Fantasy titles, absent only in eight. Shout out Quetzalcoatl! 10 and 12. He does appear in 13, though not as a summonable Eidolon. However, concept art in Final Fantasy 13 Ultimania Omega reveals that at some point in the development process, he was supposed to be included. Rama's signature attack, Judgment Bolt, rains down lightning damage on all opponents. Relatively new to the summon roster is Garuda, icon of air, whose dominant Benedicta Harmon, Walud's master spy, is actually the worst person to ever live, and if you've played to a certain point in the game slash completed the icon challenge in the demo, you know why. Garuda finds its origins in Hindu mythology, a demigod frequently depicted as the Mount of Vishnu, god of preservation. Garuda was king of the birds, an eagle-like sunbird whose wing flapping is strong enough to stop the spinning of the earth, heaven, and hell. Unlike the other summons with ties to Hindu mythology, Garuda isn't much of a departure, with Garuda appearing as a large bird-like creature who generates wind and lightning elemental attacks by flapping her wings. While Garuda appeared as an enemy as early as Final Fantasy III, they did not appear as a summonable monster until Final Fantasy XI, and wasn't summonable again until she appeared as a primal worshipped as a goddess by the Ixal in Final Fantasy XIV. As a summon, Garuda has been established as a female-presenting humanoid bird monster. She lacks the signature attack, but uses talons and wings for dealing slashing and elemental wind damage, respectively. Final Fantasy XVI's resident dragoon, Prince Dion Lesage, serves as the dominant for Bahamut, Icon of Light. Bahamut, depicted throughout the Final Fantasy series as King of Dragons, made his first appearance as an ally of sorts in 1989's Final Fantasy, promoting player characters to a new job after acquiring the item Rat's Tail. While Bahamut does have origins in early Arabic mythology, wherein it is depicted as a monster at the bottom of the support structure that holds up the Earth, Final Fantasy's Bahamut owes his characteristics to Gary Gygax and Rob Kuntz, the masterminds behind Dungeons & Dragons. The Platinum Dragon made his inaugural appearance in Greyhawk, the first supplemental game material known only as Dragon King, a name also used in the Final Fantasy series. The first use of the term Platinum Dragon appeared in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manual published in 1977, as did the personal name Bahamut. Thought to be the only one of his kind and categorized as a lesser deity, Bahamut is king of the good dragons and rival to Tiamat, evil queen of the chromatic dragons. Often considered the most powerful summon, who must be defeated by the protagonists to prove their worth before he becomes summonable. Bahamut appears in every mainline Final Fantasy title to feature summons, with the exception of 12, which at this point we don't need to explain, though like Shiva and Ifrit, he is referenced in one of the airships. Evidence of Bahamut's strength can be seen at the start of a realm re 
Gregory Bourne as he was wielded as a weapon to bring calamity, and as a little baby version in the summoner rotation. He can also only be summoned in a specific scripted boss encounter in Final Fantasy XV. Bahamut's signature attack is Mega Flare, a concentrated energy beam that deals non-elemental damage, ignoring defense and evasion. Notably, the Final Fantasy VII series features a variety of Bahamuts called Bahamut Strains, Classic Bahamut, Neo Bahamut, and Bahamut Zero. Rounding out the Icon roster is Odin, Icon of Darkness, whose dominant is Barnabas Tharm, King of Walud. Odin's origin is in Norse mythology. King of the gods who ruled over war and death, he rode upon his eight-legged horse Sleipnir, wielding his giant spear Gunganir. He sacrificed his left eye in exchange for a drink from the Well of Mimir to gain knowledge of the past, present, and future. This is one of the most direct lines from mythology to the summon, though Sleipnir is typically missing a leg or four, and Odin has two eyes? Maybe zero? Difficult to tell what's beneath the cavernous eye holes of the helmets his many variants are sporting. The most notable difference between mythology's Odin and Final Fantasy's Odin is his weapon, though he does sometimes wield his famous spear as a secondary weapon, notably in Final Fantasies V and XI. His primary weapon shares a name with his signature attack, Zantetsken, literally Iron Serving Sword, which Odin uses to slice enemies in half as he charges them, resulting in instant death. Odin made his first appearance in Final Fantasy III and returned in every mainline title thereafter, except 10, weird, and you all know the drill by now, 12, except he was referenced in the name of an airship. He doesn't appear in Final Fantasy XV, but is revealed in the follow-up novel, Final Fantasy XV Dawn of the Future, to have been one of the messengers who fought in the War of the Astrals. Whether guardian forces drawn from enemies deep within the dungeons of Final Fantasy VIII or primals flexing godly powers in Eorzea, summonable monsters will forever hold a place in the hearts of gamers as a welcome, familiar presence in any given Final Fantasy. How they'll evolve beyond the most powerful creatures in Valisthea who manifest in the form of human avatars is anyone's guess. But for now, let us revere these icons of one of gaming's most enduring series. Thanks so much for watching. For more Final Fantasy 16, make sure you subscribe to GameSpot.